E latex is a milky white fluid. Hey, hey, bro, just wait, chill, chill. Hear me out, hear me out. You're gonna need to know 17 organelles for your E-level biology. And lucky for you, that's what we're speed running in this video. We've discussed the organelles visible in the light microscope in the last video, links in the description below. As we all know, electron microscopes can zoom in way more than light microscopes, aka they have higher magnification. And so more organelles are visible to us, and the ones that were visible can actually be seen in greater detail. During AGCSEs, we had the structure of the animal and plant cells, and they were cool, you know, pretty chill. I entered my first class in A-level, we jumped from structure of the cell, this, to this, ultra structure of the cell. I ain't gonna lie bro, that's when I knew A-level seriously wasn't messing around. That one word, ultra, sort of set my mind straight. We generally see here that there are more details again to the organelles. Just keep in mind that this noodle looking thing, called the ER, as well as the free ribosomes, are more extensive in real life. We only have a few here for visual purposes. Glycogen granules can also be present. Glycogen is a huge molecule for energy storage in some cells, made of many glucose connected to each other. We move on to the micrograph taken with an electron microscope. Now everything is kind of trippy because of the coloring and details, but we can point out a few organelles here and there, like the nucleus with its nucleolus obviously, the Golgi, mitochondria, etc. This is actually a picture containing two cells split around here. But it makes sense if it's difficult to see, because the cell surface membrane, or CSM as we're going to refer it to as from now on, is extremely thin. Practically just a line if we couldn't see this much detail with an electron microscope. It appears as three layers here, separated by two dark lines. The CSM separates the inside from the outside of the cell, and controls exchange between them. Don't forget, it's 7 nanometers. This is all we need to know for now, because this apparent line actually has a whole dedicated chapter to it where we're going to learn about it in much more detail. I can give you a sneak peek though, and tell you that the CSM is made up of the structure called the phospholipid bilayer, which are even smaller, just like the microvilli. Man legit has the word micro in its name, so that speaks for itself. Microvilli are these small finger-like extensions of a cell, as you can see in these micrographs, finger-like, and what they do is increase the surface area of the cell for more efficient absorption and secretion. From this point to this point on the cell surface, if it didn't have the microvilli, for example, should be, let's say, 5 micrometers. But because of the microvilli, the surface area has increased. So here to here is another 5, then another, then another, and this drastically increases the surface area. Epithelial cells are cells which cover the surfaces of structures and tend to have a lot of microvilli. Examples of these in our bodies include the proximal convoluted tubules in our kidneys for reabsorption, and cells lining our gut to absorb all that delicious digested food into the cells of the gut. Let's shift from the smaller side characters to the main character now. The nucleus, the largest cell organelle. Well, at least for an animal cell. We're gonna discuss three main things about the nucleus. The nuclear envelope is first. It's the two membranes which surround the nucleus and contain pores called nuclear pores. Nuclear pores control the exchange between the nucleus and the outside of the nucleus, the cytoplasm. Examples of things that go in are ribosomal proteins for the nucleus to synthesize ribosomes, nucleotides for replication, for example, and hormones. Messenger RNA, mRNA for short, Transfer RNA or tRNA, as well as produced ribosomes from the nucleolus, leave the nuclear pore for protein synthesis. Inside the nucleus is a small structure that manufactures ribosomes called the nucleolus. Often darkly stained in micrographs, and depending on the needs of the cell, one or more may be present per nucleus. It contains genes coding for RNA, ribosomal RNA, as well as tRNA. The ribosomal proteins needed to make these ribosomes are imported from the cytoplasm. Lastly, we have the chromosomes and chromatin. As we know, the nucleus contains chromosomes, and these chromosomes contain DNA. This DNA is organized into genes, which control the cell's activities as well as inheritance. So it's plausible to claim that the nucleus controls the cell's activities. Anyways, the more important thing is... Bro, I forgot the intro! Assalamu alaikum guys, my name's Kipo. If you're struggling with or worried about your A-level biology, I'm here for you fam. Back to the video. Each chromosome consists of a super long DNA molecule, about 2 meters long. That's longer slash taller than you if you're comparing to the average person's height. To prevent something that long from tangling, DNA is wound with proteins called histones and to make it more compact. The nucleosome is just a repeating subunit of the chromatin. The chromatin then makes up the chromosome. As we just mentioned, the nuclear envelope is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum, which I'm going to call ER from now on. The ER is defined as a network of flattened sacs running through the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. Imagine a bunch of flat pouches or bags connected to each other by 
poses. Actually, never mind. That was a terrible analogy. But I could just show you this image so you get an idea. This is one bag cut in half, connected to this bag, connected to this bag, and you get the idea. The reason for this is because processes happen inside the ER separated from the cytoplasm, such as proteins and other molecules being transported, as well as secret drug deals. Do note, there are two different kinds of ERs, smooth ER and rough ER. Smooth ER is called smooth because of its smooth surface, and rough is, well, you get it. What makes the RER, rough endoplasmic reticulum rough, are the EDS ribosomes it's covered in. The smooth ER is also smooth because of ribosomes, or well, the lack thereof. The smooth ER does have other functions though, such as making lipids and steroids, and it acts as a calcium ion storage, which is important in muscle contraction. So muscle cells contain a lot of SER. I'm kind of skeptical they're only filled with SER because of the steroids, but what do I know? But sure, it's calcium ion storage, so you don't fill your exams. But if you're wondering, examples of steroids we're referring to are estrogen and testosterone. See, this one is smooth because no ribosomes, and this one is rough because it has ribosomes on its surface. A few definitions with important words highlighted. Starting off is the nuclear envelope, the two membranes surrounding the nucleus and contains nuclear pores. Pretty straightforward and see two membranes surrounding the nucleus and nuclear pores here and there. Nuclear pores, again pores of the nucleus, and what they do is control exchange between the nucleus and cytoplasm. Then we know the nuclear envelope is continuous with the ER, the network of flattened sacs. Right, it's a network because the flattened sacs are connected. In the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells to transport molecules, especially proteins, separate from the cytoplasm. To squeeze in some marks, if the definition question contains a lot of marks, you can mention that there are two types of endoplasmic reticulums too, the smooth ER as well as the rough ER. And what differentiates them are ribosomes. Quite a number of things you need to remember about these guys, but let's tackle them one by one. Ribosomes are tiny organelles found in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and their main function is to synthesize proteins. There are two types, 70s and 80s. 80s being larger and found in eukaryotes, which I've hinted at in a previous slide, the smaller 70s ribosomes are found in prokaryotes. But, quite the but now, 70s are also found in eukaryotes. How? Because 70s ribosomes can be found on the inside of chloroplast and mitochondria of eukaryotic cells. 80s bigger than 70s. But what's S? S is the Svedberg unit. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's not like the examiner would ask you that, so who cares? See, if we look at the ribosomes at ultra high magnification, we found out that they are composed of two subunits, a large and a small subunit, to make one ribosome. Back to these Svedberg units, or just S units, what they measure is how quickly substances sediment in an ultra centrifuge, which in simple terms is this machine that spins things at super high speeds and the heavier materials deposit at the bottom first. I'll explain this in more detail in just a bit. Just also know that the ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA, rRNA, and protein in roughly equal amounts. So this is the centrifuge used in labs. What we have here are some cells broken down leaving their organelles floating freely. The centrifuge then spins at super high speeds causing the heaviest organelle to deposit or sediment first. And if you recall, the largest organelle is the nucleus, so it will sediment first. The nucleus sediment is then filtered out somehow and the centrifuge is turned on again to spin, probably at a higher speed or for a longer duration. Then the next heaviest organelle will sediment and you get it, this process just goes on. Nerdy chimpanzees mock Luigi's embarrassing race is the lazy crafted mnemonic I made to show the order in which these organelles will sediment. You're welcome, but you can just make your own, feel free to. Just remember that the ER and CSM fragments roughly sediment together. We did mention that the function of ribosomes is protein synthesis, but keep in mind they act as more of a site for protein synthesis, meaning they allow the interaction between the molecules in protein synthesis such as amino acids and mRNA. Kind of like how a construction site allows different kinds of engineers and construction workers to interact to build a building. Not like they're just gonna randomly build a shopping complex in the restaurant they just had lunch or something. Speaking of complexes, this guy's got complex. I'm messing with you. The Golgi complex was what I meant to say. The Golgi complex is the organelle in eukaryotic cells not consisting of a network, but instead stacks of flattened sacs forming at one end and breaking into vesicles at the other. There may be more than one present in a cell, and that's because the Golgi complex processes and modifies proteins as well as other molecules. FYI, if you write its function as just modifies proteins alone, without mentioning other molecules, you still get a mark. With such a complex job, pun intended, it contains many different enzymes to aid it. 
The reason it forms vesicles are because the modified proteins are transported in these vesicles to other parts of the cell where they're needed. Or if they're needed outside the cell, the contents of the vesicles are secreted. Secreted is another important keyword, so jot that down. For instance, our goblet cells secrete a substance called mucin from the cell's Golgi. Mucin is one of the main components of the mucus found in our gas exchange system. The Golgi's enzymes are also involved in the synthesis of new cell walls. Two easiest examples of the Golgi's function is that they add sugars to proteins to make glycoproteins. Glyco from glycogen plus proteins, which makes glycoproteins. And adding sugars to lipids to make glycolipids. Glycoproteins and glycolipids are important CSM components. And lastly, Golgi are used to make lysosomes. Small spherical organelles found in eukaryotic cells. They contain hydrolytic or digestive enzymes because lysosomes have a variety of destructive functions. Examples are breaking down or digesting unwanted substances such as organelles or even entire cells. To prevent damage to the cell, the lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes separate from the rest of the cell. The vacuole of plant cells can act as a huge lysosome because it contains these enzymes. However, smaller lysosomes, like the ones found in animal cells, can also be present in plant cells. When we look inside lysosomes, the enzymes are called hydrolases because they carry out hydrolysis reactions. Hydrolysis is the breakdown of a molecule or compound with water. Hydrolysis works fastest in acidic conditions, so the content of the lysosomes are acidic. Kept at a pH of 4 to 5, compared to the roughly neutral 6.5 to 7 in the cytoplasm. A few of the enzymes contained in the lysosomes are listed here. Proteases break down proteins, nucleases break down nucleic acids, and lipases break down lipids. All the contents are enclosed in a single membrane. Lysosome activity usually falls under four categories. Destroying unwanted cell components, again with their hydrolysis enzymes, or even self-digestion, which is used to digest whole cells. All the lysosomes gotta do is release their content into the cell and khalas. Fresh new Michael Bay movie. Then we got endocytosis and exocytosis. Exocytosis is when the lysosomes are released from the cell because the digestion is required outside of the cell. What happens is the lysosome fuses with the CSM to release its contents as you can see here. Sperm heads, for example, contain a special lysosome called acrosome, which is secreted so it can digest a path through the layers of cell around the egg before fertilization. Exos outside, endos inside. Endocytosis is when materials is actually engulfed were taken in by the cell, such as when white blood cells engulf bacteria. The engulfed bacteria is now in its own vesicle. Lysosomes now come to do their job by fusing with the vesicle and releasing its enzymes to digest the bacteria. Endo and exocytosis actually require a lot of energy FYI. Which brings us to our next organelle, the mitochondria. The structure of the mitochondria is easier, so let's start with that. It has many shapes, but it's often sausage-shaped. It's one micrometer in diameter, surrounded by two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner one, containing foldings called cristine. The spaces between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space, and the interior of the organelle itself is called the matrix. The main function of the mitochondria is to carry out aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is the process in which oxygen is used to make energy from sugars. Digestible, but not easy to digest, so let's dive a little further. We get energy from the foods we eat. Most of the sugars end up being broken down to glucose, but let's say sugars and fat molecules for now. What happens now is reactions take place inside our cells in which energy is released from these fat and sugar molecules. This energy is transferred and stored temporarily in the form of this molecule called ATP. This ATP molecule is super important. It's even regarded as the universal energy carrier and is found in all living cells. Once ATP is made, it can leave the mitochondria to other parts of the cell where energy is needed. ATP's energy is released by breaking a bond in the phosphate group to make ADP. From triphosphate, meaning 3, to diphosphate, to two phosphate molecules. A phosphate can then be added to the ATP later to form ATP again, thus recycling it. But don't worry if you still don't completely get it, it's cause we'll learn this in a completely different chapter, and I don't want to dive too deep. The main takeaways though are that ATP being the energy carrier molecule in all living cells and to release the energy it's broken down to ADP. These reactions to form ATP take place in the mitochondria involving its matrix, cristae and a few other parts. That was time to be completely honest, let's just take a detour. The endosymbion theory is not required to know for your syllabus but would be good to have an idea about. So this is your moment to sit back and kinda relax. The theory basically states that eukaryotes evolved from prokaryotes. This Keep listening, it kind of makes sense. 
So when scientists discovered chloroplasts and mitochondria having their own circular DNA in smaller CMTS ribosomes, they thought, bro, this, this is kind of sus, don't you think? This led them to theorize that long ago, when, I don't know, you were still happy, chloroplasts and mitochondria were in fact ancient bacteria, which now live inside larger animal and plant cells. If you look at the name of the theory itself, endo means inside, and symbiont basically means an organism which lives in a mutually beneficial relationship with another organism. Like this pat was about to eat this M&M till he realized, hold up, this M&M benefits me, and I benefit it. Somehow. So instead of digesting it, the M&M now lives inside of the Pac-Man, both benefiting each other and they live happily ever after. The small DNA and ribosomes of the bacteria are still present because they code and synthesize for some vital proteins. Unfortunately, the relationship is somewhat toxic because mitochondria and chloroplasts can no longer live independently. Back to the main story. About microtubules and microtubule organizing centers, or MTOCs for short. One of my least favorite organelles, not gonna lie. All you need to know is that microtubules are long, rigid, hollow tubes found in the cytoplasm and are about 25 nanometers in diameter. See this over here? Hollow tube. What they do is essentially form a cytoskeleton to give the cell shape and help with movement inside and outside the cell. Movement inside the cell consists of forming a transport system for secretory vesicles throughout the cell and outside the cell in the form of cilia and flagella, which we'll get to in a bit. So to form these microtubules, you need the protein tubulin, which comes in two forms, alpha and beta. These are combined to form a dimer. Many dimers are joined to form long protofilaments. Now, 13 protofilaments will be lined up and rolled to form this tube we know as the microtubule. To give a slightly more visual explanation, 13 protofilaments are basically arranged end to end to form a flat sheet. Then is this rule to form a microtube, which looks like this from the top. The structure seems weird, but its functions are it seems a bit more interesting. For example, spinal fibers, which help separate chromosomes during nuclear division, are made of microtubules. They also form part of centrioles, another cylindrical structure we'll talk about in a bit. And then they form cilia and flagella. These help the cell move. That's microtubules. MTOCs, on the other hand, are the special locations in the cell where microtubules are assembled from tubes and molecules. We just need to know that the microtubules can be formed and broken down easily according to the cell's needs. For instance, let's say mitosis is occurring and the cell is going to need more spindles, these yellow strings. Then more spindles can be made and broken down until the process is finished. The yellow noodle lines in this image are just the microtubules, and you can see how they're like pretty much spread out around the cell. And this helps keep the shape, act as a cytoskeleton or, as we discussed before, form other cylindrical structures called centrioles. Two hollow cylinders form from a microtubule ring and are right angled to each other. They actually appear as one in a light microscope, but the extra resolution in the electron microscope reveals that there are two cylinders, each about 500 nanometers long. Don't need to know much for centrosomes, but just remember, it's the organelle or region just outside the nucleus containing the two centrioles, and is the main MTOC in animal cells. Fun fact though, is if a cell has more than one nucleus, each nucleus will have its own centrosome. The nine triplets here is referring to the structure of the centrioles, which we know are made from microtubules. Three microtubules form a triplet. One, two, three. We arrange nine triplets in this string manner and bam, we get a centriole. And yes, again, 500 nanometers length, as we mentioned before. Micrograph. We can see the centrioles right angle to each other. One is visible in the longitudinal section, and the other clearly showing the nine triplets in the transverse section. Important to note that the MTOCs in nuclear division are the centrosomes, not the centrioles. However, when it comes to cilia and flagella, the centrioles do act as MTOCs. They form part of the cilia and flagella. Quite the mouthful, but they are whip-like beating structures which cause locomotion or movement of fluid across the cell surface in many eukaryotic cells. They aren't exactly identical, so when defining cilia, you can use hair-like instead of whip-like because one of the differences between them is that cilia are shorter and are very numerous in a cell. Flagella, on the other hand, are longer, with only a few found per cell. We don't need to know the structure of the flagella as of this year's syllabus, but we do need to know the structure of the cilia, which is somewhat similar to the structure of the centrioles. The first difference that you might have noticed is that we have two central singlet microtubules. The outer ring is made of nine microtubule doublets, MTDs for short, which is referred to as a 9 plus 2 structure. 9 for the 9 microtubule rings and 2 central singlet microtubules. The doublet contains A and B microtubules. A has a complete 13 protofilaments expected of a microtubule, and B got the short end of the stick with just 10. 
A is given extra privilege too because it has an inner and outer arm made of the protein dynein. So it can connect to the B microtubules of neighboring MTDs during beating. Everything inside the CSM here is called the axon unit. The basal bodies has the same structure as centrioles because these centrioles actually replicate themselves to produce the basal bodies and the cilia and flagella grow from these basal bodies. Structure down, we can now talk about the beating. No, not the kind you get from your parents. The beating mechanism of cilia and flagella to cause locomotion. The beating is caused by the dynein arms of one MTD making contact and moving along neighboring MTDs. This happens at different regions in the cilia and flagella as well as at different times. So some may be in contact and moving along their neighboring MTDs, while others on the other side just stay stagnant. Again, because this happens at different times and different regions, it results in the bending and beating of the cilia and flagella overall. Both of them cause locomotion, but their roles are slightly different. Cilia being small and numerous tend to move things across the cell's surface, such as with the epithelial cells in our airways. Flagella, on the other hand, causes movement of the entire cell, such as with the sperm cell. Please sub if you're liking the content, by the way, so I can make my mama proud. Next is, oh dear lord, we're in the plant territory now. Least favorite part of bio, but what can we do? The organelle that carries out photosynthesis. It has an elongated shape and is surrounded by an inner and outer membrane. Ranging from 3 to 10 micrometers and containing fat droplets, these black spots here, these guys have so much going on they might as well be their own cell. Oh, right. Yeah, they have their own 70S ribosomes and circular DNA too. The material or a fluid inside the chloroplast is called the stroma not including these pancake-looking thingies. Those are the thylakoids. Each thylakoid is a membrane-bound, fluid-filled sac. Stack multiple thylakoids on top of each other and you get a granum, and the plural of that is grana. The function of the chloroplast is to carry out photosynthesis. The first stage of photosynthesis involves photosynthetic pigments, such as chlorophyll, found in the chloroplast, absorbing light energy. The second stage uses the energy and reducing power generated from the first stage to convert carbon dioxide into sugars. It'll make more sense when you get to the photosynthesis chapter for your A2s, but yeah, that sums up chloroplasts. And what else is found in the plant cells and not animal cells? Cell walls. The primary wall is basically a layer containing parallel fibers of cellulose and other side character polysaccharides like hemicellulose and pectins. See? One layer of parallel cellulose fibers, and the smaller pink and green ones are the other polysaccharides. Cellulose is the main character here because it's inelastic and has a high tensile strength meaning it's difficult to break or stretch when you pull it on each end. The problem here though is that what if I just pull it from the other side, not from the ends of the fibers? That's not an issue either because the cell wall has multiple layers of parallel cellulose fibers running in different directions, so the wall is strong no matter which direction you pull from. This guy can also take creatine to buff itself. The cell wall can reinforce itself with lignin, and what lignin does is add compressional strength to the cell wall, thus making it difficult to squeeze in a sense. This all adds up when we realize a main function of the cell wall is mechanical strength of the cell and the plant as a whole. Water enters the cell by osmosis prompting it to explode like an animal cell? No problem, cell wall is strong enough to prevent that. The different orientations of the cellulose layers as the cell grows actually help determine the cell shape too. Finally, the cell wall forms the apoplastic pathway. Discussed more in detail in chapter 7, it's about the movement of water and mineral ions through cell walls in simple terms. While the cell wall helps prevent the cell from bursting, the vacuole doesn't. That's not a bad thing though, because the osmotic uptake of water by the vacuole causes the cell to expand and contributes to its growth. If you're not aware, the vacuole is a membrane-bound organelle in eukaryotic cells. It's small and temporary in animal cells, but in plant cells, like we're about to discuss, they are large and permanent, mainly for storage purposes, but they have a few other functions. Osmosis summarized again is the movement of water from a higher water potential to a lower water potential basically where there's more water to where there's less water. Since these vacuoles are relatively concentrated, water enters the cell by osmosis, making the cell more turgid and less wilting of the plant. Imagine car tires. When you pump it and it becomes stronger, that's what happens when water enters a plant cell. The tire being well inflated is the cell being turgid. When all the four tires are well pumped, the car stands right, just like when all the plant cells are turgid. It can stand upright, no wilting. Kinda weird to think that the same organelle acts as a food and waste reserve, Definitely wouldn't slide if humans were like that, but yeah. By food, we mean sucrose and mineral salts, for example. What kind of waste? I don't want to know. I'm joking. Calcium oxalate crystals is an example of waste kept in the vacuole. Like lysosomes, vacuoles act as a giant lysosome, containing hydrolase enzymes, again to break down stuff with water, hydrolysis. It's best to know all these functions, but maybe keep three or four memorized pretty well if this comes up in your paper. 
Lastly, chemicals essential for survival called secondary metabolites are stored in the vacuole. They're not your basic chemicals. No. These lads, for instance, anthocyanins, are pigments for flowers and fruits to attract pollinators. Blue, red, purple, you name it all. Not just green, like the other parts of the plant. Some alkaloids and tannins prevent herbivores from eating the plants. The sus ones, though, are the latex. The latex is a milky white fluid that- Hey, hey, bro, just- Wait, chill, chill, hear me out, hear me out. That isn't why I said they were sus. They accumulate in the vacuoles and help protect it against pathogens and herbivores. Cool. Reason I said they were sus is because in opium poppy, for example, the plant's latex contains alkaloids such as morphine, from which opium and heroin are obtained. So, uh, do what you will with that information, you're not getting it anymore. Because that concludes all the organelles. Here's a list of the new organelles and structures that we discovered with an electron microscope because they're not visible with a light microscope. Microvilli, ER, remember there is rough and smooth, microtubules and MTOCs, ribosomes, glycogen granules, cilia and flagella, and then finally, lysosomes. Please sub or like or comment, anything that helps the channel grow is greatly appreciated. And as always, bio is the best science, no debate. Peace and assalamu alaikum.